Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeads, and welcome to the third video in our Writing Like a Scholar series. Today we'll be talking about FRQ scoring guides, and we'll be going through how to use them from both a student and from a teacher perspective. Uh, just one quick reminder to please subscribe to the channel if you don't already, uh, to watch out for upcoming videos four and five in this series, as well as some really cool videos from the second semester that will be focused on study tips for unit exams, but then also a six week crash course leading up to the exam in May. So first we'll just cover some FRQ basics here. Uh, the very first thing we need to know about FRQs is that there are no partial points. So you can either earn uh, one point for an answer or two points, but there's just no such thing as half points. So that's a really important uh, concept to understand here before we go further. Also, you can only earn answers that are on the scoring rubric. And so a lot of times students will provide an answer that's maybe feasible, uh, like, for example, humans littering being a cause for biodiversity loss. And like, while it's potential that us throwing garbage on the ground as individuals could kill some animals and potentially lower their population sizes, it's not really one of the major human activities that leads to biodiversity loss. So remember that that scoring guide was created with all of the potential answers in mind. And again, the readers really want you to gravitate towards these answers that are kind of the big picture concepts. And if you're struggling to come up with those in the midst or in the course of your FRQ writing, go back to video two and check out some of those big picture ideas that you should always be trying to connect your answers to. Another important point is that your wording does not have to be exactly the same as the rubric. If you have an equivalent idea, and we'll talk about what that means as we score some practice FRQs in a little bit, that is able to earn you a point. Uh, my fourth tip here or piece of advice as you use rubrics is when in doubt, uh, go to the College Board website, which we'll talk about shortly, and find some student samples with the scoring and commentary. So I'll show you how to do that in a second. This is the most helpful tip to teachers as you're grading, but also to students if you want to understand which responses will earn points and which ones will not earn points. Uh, another point is that all of the portions of an answer must be addressed uh, in the student answer in order to earn points. So if you start out on the right track, but you leave out a key detail that is specified on the scoring rubric uh, that will not earn you a point, and then finally, we should know that each FRQ will be scored out of 10 points. There will be three FRQs on the 2021 exam, and presumably those will each be out of 10 points. I know last year there was uh, 12 and an eight, but that was kind of uh, extenuating circumstances. And so what I tell my students is that their target score should be about a six out of 10. Uh, if you score about a six out of 10 on average on the three FRQs, and you combine that with a similar average on multiple choice, that should put you in range to get a solid three or potentially a four. Again, there's no official cut scores release. We don't know exactly what you need to score, but if you're consistently scoring a six out of 10 average on FRQs and a 60% of multiple choice, you should be in solid shape again for a high three or a low four. All right, so where do we find these FRQ scoring guides that are so helpful? Uh, so I wanna point out that all FRQ scoring guides from previous exams, excluding the 2020 exam, are released publicly on the College Board website and there's a link in the description below. On the next uh, segment of the video, I'll be walking you through that website and how to find the scoring guides and how to use them. Uh, students, my advice to you is if you're not writing a ton of FRQs in class, you can always go and find these FRQs on the College Board website. Again, the link will be in the description. I will also walk you through how to use that website shortly. And you can write an FRQ yourself. So just put a 23 minute timer on, uh, try to write the entire FRQ and then find the scoring guide and grade it yourself. This is phenomenal practice. Uh, this is the best way to become a better FRQ writer. Teachers, one thing you can do is assign a lot of practice FRQs. I recommend full length practice FRQs, but you can also just chunk it into a couple letters, have students write them and then self score and reflect on what their mistakes were and what corrections they might make. So this is really helpful uh, for teachers and students alike. Another kind of pro tip that I recommend for teachers that I picked up at an AP conference from a colleague couple years ago is to every once in a while score student FRQs, but don't write any feedback on the FRQ. Don't give the student any feedback and don't give them their score. Simply return it to them to correct themselves and then give them the opportunity to earn bonus points if they can score the FRQ either perfectly, so exactly as you scored it or within one point. This is huge because it teaches students to understand what points are going to be earned on their FRQs and what points are not going to be earned. All right, so here we have the AP uh, College Board released environmental science FRQs. So these are gonna be FRQs from 2018 going back, and you can find this just by Googling it or by using the link in the description below. 
And so what I really like to do is give my students the sample response questions, which also have the scoring rubric. So if we open this up, what we'll see is that the first thing is the scoring rubric. And so it's really helpful uh, if this loads here to scroll down and see, first of all, what does the rubric look like? What points would uh, earn credit or what answers would earn credit and which, which ones would not? And then if students want to dig a little deeper and understand, well, what does a two point answer here look like? Or what does a zero point answer here look like? They can scroll down and read through these student examples. And then if you go all the way to the bottom, this is the really, really helpful part uh, for both students and teachers is that you can see exactly why the student earned the points they did. So the reader will actually quote the segment of the student answer that earned the point. Uh, and they will explain sometimes why the student did not earn the point. So this is probably the single uh, most impactful way to become a better FRQ grader if you're a teacher and a better FRQ writer if you're a student. So some additional advice that I have for teachers is this. Make sure that you are assigning your students as many FRQs as possible. Uh, I would always try to time them at 23 minutes so they get very comfortable with that exam pacing. And then ideally, you would assign them at least one full length FRQ per week. I know, I know that might sound like a ton of grading. And the caveat I would provide is you don't necessarily have to grade every FRQ that you assign your students. You can assign the FRQ and then actually ask the students to self score, reflect and correct their answers using a correction link that's in the description below. It's a Google form that will walk you through exactly how to correct your FRQ and how to build these correction forms uh, for your own FRQs that you assign. Uh, another really helpful tool, which sounds kind of counterintuitive, um, but has been really game changing for my students over the years, is during the first semester, actually posting the scoring guide to an FRQ that you're going to assign in class on Friday to whatever your learning management system is on Monday. And I know you might be thinking like, you know, this is crazy. Why would I give the students the answer key to an FRQ they're going to write on Friday? Um, and that answer key is really a guide for teachers and for scorers to understand how to score FRQs. It's not necessarily student answers ready to go. So students still have to look through that scoring guide, understand what it's saying and integrate it with their own knowledge about the course in order to write quality answers. And so typically what I'll do is for a, a good stretch of the first semester, I'll actually post the scoring guide again on a Monday and tell students we're writing this FRQ on Friday. And I encourage students to prepare. I encourage them to look at these student examples. And even with the scoring guide, it's still incredibly hard to write a perfect FRQ. Um, very few students can actually write a 10 out of 10 or a 9 out of 10, even with the scoring guide. Uh, they're just that challenging. And so this really helps support, especially students who struggle to take in all the content and crank out a quality answer in 23 minutes. And so instead of them just spinning their wheels and really struggling, they understand what it feels like to write a quality answer. And then you can slowly remove that scaffold uh, throughout the first semester or just cut it off as you enter into the second semester. Um, again, the caveat I would provide here is that you should still have your students writing some authentic FRQs that they have not seen before. And so one great way to do that is to build what I call Franken FRQs, where you uh, splice out like a letter here, a letter there, from a bunch of different FRQs. And one, this makes it hard for students to go on the College Board website and find the scoring guide ahead of time. It's really hard to predict, you know, which five individual letters you're gonna pull out of FRQs. But it also allows you to tailor an FRQ to really address one unit rather than addressing numerous units, which you may not have covered yet. So especially in the year, this is a super valuable way to still give genuine assessments where the students have not prepared for the FRQ and where they have to, you know, write it basically under duress like they'll have to on the exam in May. All right, so now we'll actually practice scoring some sample student answers. So I want you to pause the video here, take a look at this sample answer and the rubric above it, and then give this a score out of two points. So if we take a look at this student answer and the rubric, this would be a zero out of two. Um, so they have said that carbon dioxide can go deep in the ocean because it's colder as you go further down. Uh, it makes the water molecules more tightly packed and the carbon molecules, you know, are stored in this. This doesn't really fit with anything on the scoring guide. They were somewhat close to the idea that carbon dioxide can dissolve directly into the ocean, but they haven't used that phrase dissolve. This is a really important phrase if you're going to talk about direct exchange. So this would be a zero out of two. So we have another practice here. 
same scoring rubric, but a different response. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can score this student sample. So this would be a two out of two. And let's look at the exact points on the rubric that they earn. Biological pump point is this idea that organisms that are in the upper ocean or closer to the surface can die and sink to the bottom. So notice the student did not use the phrase biological point, and that is totally fine. They have given an equivalent idea, which is that decayed organisms that have you know, died and sunk to the bottom of the ocean uh, can be turned into fossil fuels. And so that is an equivalent idea. And so it would earn that biological pump point. The second point they earned is the direct exchange point. So atmospheric CO2 can dissolve directly into the water. Now notice they said it's absorbed in the form of, and then they added dissolved carbon dioxide. I would not award this point if the student had not added in that dissolved with the little carrot there uh, to basically save that point. And so that is a critical term. It must be in their answer. Uh, if they say that carbon dioxide just exchanges between atmosphere and ocean, I would not award the point. Um, so again, you have to be really strict with how you apply the rubric. All right, we have a different uh, prompt and a different answer here. So go ahead, pause the video and see if you could score this one. So this is another great example of a student uh, having the right idea, but not having the right language to earn this point. So this is going to be a zero out of one. But if we look at the scoring guide, they were attempting to earn this point up here that because of genetic diversity, some individuals are naturally resistant and will survive, but they did not use the phrase genetic diversity and they did not really address this idea of survival and reproduction. So that is why they did not earn this point. So here we have another response, uh, same question, different response. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can score this answer. So this would earn a point and we should look at exactly where the point was earned. And it was that first point that the last student attempted. Notice the big difference here though, is that this student is using apes vocabulary. They're actually mentioning genetic diversity or genetic variants. Uh, specifically, they're talking about how this will increase the chances of survival for some of the bats and how those bats will be resistant and then survive, reproduce, and pass on those resistant genes to their offspring. So again, it's the same idea fundamentally, but they have used apes vocabulary and they have explained themselves fully. All right, we'll wrap up today with one final uh, set of answers here. So go ahead and pause the video, try to score this first answer here to a new prompt, and this would be scored out of two points. All right, so this would be a two out of two. And so let's take a look at which points they earned. First point they earned is this idea that if the bat population is smaller and their predators continue to use them as a food source at a consistent rate as they were before, that population is gonna be extra vulnerable because of their decreased size. Um, this was not the strongest response to earn this point, but the scorer this year did award this point. Their next answer is a really solid point. And this is this idea that a smaller population size has reduced genetic diversity and therefore they are more susceptible to a future environmental disturbance, such as a second disease to come through the population. And then one final sample answer here again, same prompt, different answer, pause the video and see if you can give this a score out of two points. So this would be a zero out of two. And so if we take a look here, basically what the student has done has identified two threats to the bat population, but kind of uh, irrespective of the bat population size. So humans being a threat due to the habitat removal, okay, that is a threat to the bat population, but it's not really a unique threat based on the bats uh, decreased population size. And then other predators are a threat, but other predators are always a threat. Uh, what the student has not done is specified that with a decreased population size, they are especially vulnerable to being driven out of the ecosystem if they're continuing to be preyed on at the rate before their population decrease. All right, everybody, thanks for watching the third video in the Write Like a Scholar series. I hope it was helpful to see where to find uh, the FRQ scoring rubrics and to understand a little bit better how to apply them to your own practice FRQs. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet already, uh, please do that. The fourth and fifth videos in the series will be coming up uh, next Saturday and the Saturday after that. And then if you haven't checked out the notes videos, make sure to check those out. They're linked below. And as always, think like a mountain, write like a scholar.